Alrighty, welcome Western New York Photo Walkers. It's Chris Reddy here, and we've got a fun uh, tutorial Thursday going tonight. We are going to look a little bit at some night photography, and by night photography, I mean usually either Milky Way photography or star trails. We can also go get into, depending on if there's any interest expressed, nightscape photography, long exposure photography, that kind of stuff. So we're going to be taking a look at a variety of things because now's the time of year usually when most people like to get outside and don't mind being out kind of late at night to get some nice shots of the moon, stars, uh, Milky Way. But we're going to be talking a bunch about nightscape photography and we're going to talk tonight specifically about Milky Way photography. I know a lot of, I've seen a lot of posts uh, down at Hemlock Lake and a lot of people going down there. There's other places we, you can go to and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But we're going to look at some of the things having to do with uh, night photography and Milky Way photography. And specifically, we're going to get into um, some hints and tips. And tonight, I'm going to spend probably the, the last 45 minutes or so, half an hour to 45 minutes, actually talking about some basic post-processing to get you started with Milky Way uh, photographs. The biggest thing with Milky Way photographs is that there are so many varieties of ways you can process it. I remember when I first started with it, it was daunting trying to figure out just what's going on with where do I start? How do I get this to look the way I want it to look, the way I remember seeing it? So we're going to look at uh, both uh, some post-processing tips. There are some links on the screen right now. These are some places that I've seen that, that they really know what they're doing, uh, especially a gentleman by the name of Ian Norman, Lonely Spec is his, his handle on YouTube, uh, does a phenomenal job uh, and explains things, does some beautiful photography. He's got an advantage in that he goes all over the country and photographs Milky Way. But uh, uh, Ian Norman is a great resource, lonelyspec.com, great YouTube channel. Uh, Another great resource is Photo Pills. It gives you all the information you need about where the Milky Way is going to be. It's invaluable for seeing at any point in time and any place on Earth where the Milky Way is going to be, where the suns and planets are, the sun and planets are going to be, where the moon's going to be, what direction you need to face. Would this make a good location? Excellent tool. Very, very much worth the the. I think it's nine dollars on both Android and iOS. Um, but it's a, it's a great resource. Another one online, the uh, TPE, I call it, photoephemeris.com. Uh, excellent tool, similar to, similar to photo pills. Um, another site, Dark Site Finder, helps you to find in your area or where, if you're going on vacation, where there might be a good dark sky area. So Dark sky, Site Finder is excellent. I'll show you what that looks like. And photographing space, a very a more advanced, more for astrophotography, but does a great job. Very um, clear tutorials on how to do that. So, a couple things you need to find out and you need to realize, and that is that uh, it really matters where you are. If you're anywhere close to a city with the lights and everything, it's just... It, it's not happening. It's just really going to, the light pollution around is just going to gonna screw you up. So the biggest thing is you want to try and find as dark a sky as possible. We're fortunate in that relatively close, the Adirondacks. It's a six-hour drive, yeah, but the Adirondacks have some of the darkest skies around, some of the greatest vistas, um, great place to, to do astrophotography, any kind of star photography, moon photography, or Milky Way photography. Uh, some of the things you'll want to figure out is for your camera, your lens, what, it, what the exposure is. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But you're there for a while anyway. Try a variety of exposures. Different cameras have different capabilities as far as low light, high ISO capabilities. In general, Full frame cameras do a better job at capturing low light. They just do. Uh, but we're going to be working on a picture tonight that in Lightroom that I took with my D5300, which is an APS-C uh, camera. It has decent low light capability, but not the greatest, but you can still get some great images. Uh, the catch-22 is this. 
you're pointing up at a very dark sky, but you're trying to catch relatively bright objects, but in terms of how much light is actually coming into your the sensor of your camera, it's just barely there. So it you need to let in more light and or, or increase your exposure, and you can do that by raising your ISO, but that increases the digital noise. You can expose for a longer period of time, but whether it looks like it or not, everything up above us is moving at a ridiculous speed. And when it comes right down to it, I'll show you some, some charts that'll help you figure out a good speed. The bottom line is shutter speed, you need to get it fast enough to stop any apparent motion, but slow enough to let in as much light as possible. And that's where boosting your ISO lets you use a, a sufficiently long exposure and keep things from getting blurry. Just like when you're taking sports photos, you need to shoot at a faster shutter speed to freeze action. Well, we're talking about people running at 23 miles an hour. Well, now we're talking about planets that are moving at hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. So there's a difference, but they're a little bit further away. So I'll show you a great chart helps you to figure out where to where to start. And again, you don't just this isn't film. Thankfully, we don't just take one picture and go home and develop it. We can take a variety of pictures around where we think we need to be with our exposure. And then you've got something to choose from. So it'll help you all the way around as a starting point where to go up uh, uh, below and above with your exposure. Another key point is usually when you're shooting uh, outside at night, it's dark. And yes, as part of your your camera bag, you should have some kind of a, uh, a headlight, freeze up your hands. Yes, you can use the light on your phone, but it's a lot more convenient if you have a headlight on and you can just look at your camera and see what, what's going on there. Uh, but the bigger problem is not setting your settings. I like to do that when I'm in the car before I get out. But the bigger problem is focusing. How you focus on something that is bazillions of miles away and is the size of a, pin, a pinhead. Well, there's some tools you can use. Um, one thing that I do is on the lens that I usually use for Milky Way photography, I focus during the daytime. I focus on the furthest thing I can see, whatever, the end of the street, the building far away, the tree at the end of the yard, whatever is furthest away from you that you can focus on. I focus on that using the magnification on my camera. And then I shut off the autofocus and I put a piece of tape on the focus ring so that it doesn't move. That way I know I'm at a good starting point of where infinity should be when I'm pointing up at a black sky. You can always verify it and I'll show you in how to do that, but you can always verify that by turning on live view and magnifying your view but you need to see something and whether it's a light in the distance or a star or something that is as far away as you can focus, use that live view and the magnification so that you can uh, make sure you're crisp and, and clear. There's nothing worse than spending several hours in the dark out in the middle of nowhere taking pictures and finding out that when you turned your lens to infinity because that's where the infinity mark is, that that's not really quite focused quite enough and I, it, you'd be hard pressed to find a lens where absolutely under all conditions that infinity mark is absolutely perfectly focused at the furthest distance. It isn't. Uh, a lot of lenses I've seen, and check your own lenses, you'll see that a lot of times the focusing ring will go past infinity because as, as lenses expand and contract with heat and cold, they can that focus point can change even a little bit and it doesn't take much for it to be a little bit out of focus. You'll still get a picture, but it won't be as crisp and clear as you would like it to be, or as you know that it can be. With nightscape photography, it's always good to try and include something in the foreground. Just compositionally, it's better. If you, if you take a look at any of the moon pictures you've seen, just a picture of the circle of the moon, okay, yeah, you got a picture of the moon. But the pictures that really are, are impressive, the composition, is when the moon is put in context, whether it's over a barn, a silo, a lighthouse, a lake, behind buildings of a city, something to give you an idea of the scale. Just a picture of the moon is just that. It's, it's a photograph of the moon, and 
but the composition can be improved by including something in context, something on Earth. Okay, uh, we'll talk about star trails here in a second. We're not going to do any star trails tonight, but the star trails rule, what we're trying to do is eliminate star trails. We want a sharp Milky Way picture. We don't want star trails. We don't want streaks of light, and that's what the 300 rule will help us with. Uh, one, one hint here, you might want to make sure before you head out, is take the LCD screen and turn its brightness to the lowest level. Otherwise, you're going to get blinded every time you try and, and focus. Uh, turn it all the way down to the lowest brightness level. You don't need it when it's that dark out. You'll be able to see it just fine. And also, shoot raw. I'll show you some examples tonight, but you want to shoot raw, even if you don't know how to process it. If you have to shoot JPEG because that's it, you don't know how to process raw, Shoot raw plus JPEG. You will thank me a million times over. Shoot raw, especially for night photography. Okay, so in general, and this is a quick chart that will show you. First, you're going to find a, a location that has the lowest light pollution possible. You're going to set the tripod or confirm with something like Photopills or Photographer's Ephemeris which way the Milky Way is going to be. Where is it? Where is it physically located? do this ahead of time as much as possible and then once you're there most of these have an a uh, an augmented reality mode that you can hold it up and you can see where the milky way is going to be crossing the horizon that will help you with your composition it'll help you line things up uh, you're gonna you have to use a tripod there's no two ways about it uh, the sturdier the tripod the better when you're using a tripod and you're going to be taking any kind of long exposure do a couple things if you've got a lot of tripods have a center hook where you can hook your camera bag on it to hold it down, use that. Put, put some kind of weight on it. You can also buy auxiliary bags that will hang from that, but you can grab a milk jug, fill it with water, and hang it on there too. Uh, another thing to do, take your camera strap and remove it. Take it off of your camera. Hopefully you've got a quick release on it, but take your camera strap off any wind whatsoever a little five mile an hour breeze will shake your camera it really will and it doesn't take much shaking at all walking around your camera will shake your camera so you want to minimize any of that because you're focusing a ridiculous ways away and any movement at all is going to be accentuated and multiplied okay point the camera in the direction you want to go compose your photograph talk we talked about the the uh, uh including something in the foreground, the composition. You're going to focus uh, on it. Uh, you're going to reduce the brightness of your camera. You're going to try and minimize that. A lot of cameras will have an actual door where you can close the eyepiece down, shut down the eyepiece. That will help any, if you have a flashlight, it'll help anything from going in and, and uh, exposing through the eyepiece. That can happen. Um, uh, also, you're going to uh, focus on infinity through an extra external light um, or a distant source of light, a, a, a lamp post or a, lamp, a street light that's in a city on a far shore. You can use that to focus on. It doesn't have to be, you know, the brightest star. Anything past usually a hundred feet is going to be an infinity focus anyway. Uh, so you're going to focus at infinity. You're going to set the maximum aperture of your lens. 2.8, 1.8, whatever you can afford, but try and use as fast a lens as possible, one that let, will let in as much light as possible. You're going to set your ISO to the maximum acceptable ISO that, that you've hopefully done the test that I've talked about a million times, where you take a series of pictures just out in bright sunlight and you look at those pictures at different ISO settings and see how your camera does. On this camera that I'm shooting with right here, the D5300, this does pretty good up until about ISO 3200 and then the image quality just, just suffers terribly. On the Nikon D810 that I have, I can shoot at ISO 6400 and just get some beautiful shots. It's just a full frame camera that does much better with high ISO. So find that out for your camera where's the sweet spot where's the point where you don't want to you don't want to bother you can set these to shoot at iso 1000 or or 100,000 and yes it'll take a picture but you're not going to like the results so find out what the best maximum iso is for your camera and go from there okay so okay
then we're going to control the shutter speed. This is where the 300 rule that we talked about, where you can minimize the amount of star trails. Uh, I'll show you a chart here for the 300 rule. And then you're going to look at the histogram and make sure that you're getting an exposure. It's not going to look right on the back of your camera, but you want to make sure that you're actually getting an exposure. Okay, so uh, I talked a little bit about Dark Sight Finder. This is Hemlock Lake. This is a, a Google Map view of Hemlock Lake. Uh, when you go down there, and now we're going to overlay the Dark Sight, uh, the Dark Sky Finder, and this is what's called the Bortle Scale that actually they've measured the amount of, of peripheral light, the amount of light pollution in these areas. Hemlock Lake shoots into one of the darker areas. It's about fourth darkest on the Bortle scale, but it does give us, uh, in our area, a very close uh, place to go and shoot into a dark, uh, low noise pollution area. If you'll notice, and this is on my bucket list for this summer, if you'll notice, out past Hilton, there's an area that is equally dark to Hemlock Lake. Now you're shooting from dark to a lighter area, but it's roughly equivalent to Hemlock Lake. And I'm going to be heading out there at some point this summer on a clear night, and I just want to see if we can do any, any Milky Way photography there. Probably should be. Should be able to. Uh, it's about a 35-45 minute drive. Uh, I'm sure Linda Scalise has been there plenty of times. It's down past her place, but uh, it's a good should be a good place to get some photography, some um, Milky Way photography going. Set, set, set your camera on RAW, the highest quality RAW that you've got, depending on your camera. You want to shoot a large JPEG, or excuse me, large RAW, and you can include JPEG also. Uh, on the picture that we're going to edit tonight, the photographs that I took are on my D5300, but I also had my DA-10, and I was shooting time lapses with the 5300, and I was shooting photographs with the DA-10. So there's, uh, I don't like to waste my time when I'm out at 11 o'clock at night, so I try and use as much, uh, as, much as possible as many of the uh, cameras as I can muster and do a lot of photography. So this is Hemlock Lake. This is the JPEG that was taken at the same time as the RAW photo. It's there. You can tell the, the Milky Way is there. Once it's processed in, in Lightroom uh, with the process that I'll, I'll be showing you today, and it, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but this one I found gives me really nice results. Um, you can get some excellent results right from within Lightroom. You can go into Photoshop and do even more, but the comparison between what you get with RAW versus, pro, uh, versus RAW, or JPEG versus RAW, uh, an amazing difference. Okay, so um, your composition, like I was mentioning, you want to try and include something in the foreground. Uh, this was a, just a, an attempt at light painting the stairs going up to Hemlock Lake along with the Milky Way exposure. Just wanted to see if it would work. It did. Uh, it's way too bright for this, but I didn't bother toning it down. I wanted to show a composition that included something in the foreground. Okay, so the... Um, The other thing I want you to consider, other than just shooting a nice wide, and I'll show you what we're going to be using to, or editing tonight is a panorama, a two-shot panorama. Instead of just shooting wide like this, this is two shots side by side, you can also shoot vertically. This is six shots in landscape mode, but shot vertically. The last one at the very, very top there is directly overhead. It is with the camera pointed up and above and stitched together it gives you a much larger view of the entire Milky Way because it does go continue all the way over our head all the way to the other horizon. We just can't see it because there's light pollution behind us. But this is a panorama stitched in Lightroom that is six images tall. So try it. It gives you something else to work with. Okay, so the, 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 the beast that gets in the way with Milky Way photography is star trails. And that is basically the stars moving, we're moving, they're moving, everything's moving. Uh, and you want to find the sweet spot for your camera and lens combination that will give you the most possible exposure without any evidence of star trails. And it has to do with the size of the pixel in your sensor. So full frame sensors have bigger pixels usually. Smaller 
APS-C cameras have smaller pixels, so the size of the pixel compared with how long it's exposed, generally full-frame cameras can't shoot for quite as long as APS-C cameras without seeing any effect. For instance, if we look at this uh, animation here, at 15 seconds at a at 24 millimeter, there's no star trails. As you go up longer and longer, you start to see star trails. So the idea is with different size sensors, because of the size of the photosite, the size of each pixel, the bigger the pixel, the more evidence there will be, excuse me, the bigger the pixel, then any movement is going to stay within that pixel. On a smaller camera with a higher density, for instance, an APS-C camera has uh, one and a half times as many pixels in the same area. And so you'll see movement because it's crossing from one pixel to another. And you'll, ha you'll have a uh, uh, shorter time with an APS-C camera. Okay, so this chart, we've all heard about the 600 rule. And that's, that works for film. However... When we go to digital photography, I've tried these. I did an experiment. I got photos from a pile of people that were taking pictures at Hemlock Lake, and they sent their pictures to me, and I captured the exposure information. And all the way up to the 300 rule, everything above 300, you can actually see star movement. So uh, somewhere between 3 and 350 is, is a good rule. The idea here is... That you take your focal length. In this case, I was I was using a 14 millimeter lens. The wider it is, then the longer your exposure can be. But on mine, with a 14 millimeter lens, with the 300 rule, on a full frame camera, I can shoot for 21 seconds. On a cropped image camera, I can shoot for 32 seconds. Okay, it's about a 50 percent crop. All right, and so you can do 50% longer with uh, an APS-C camera without seeing star trails. If you look on that same line when it goes 21 to, uh, from 21 to 32, 29, 43, if we go to the, 60, the 600 rule, which is, works with film, on a full-frame camera, it says I can shoot at 43 seconds. That doesn't work. It's just ridiculous star trails. So taking actual data from actual photographs and seeing where the star trails stop, it's around the 300 rule. So in this case, I know in my full frame camera, I can shoot for about 20 seconds. And on my APS-C camera, I can shoot for about 30 seconds without getting any star trails. Okay. It's a place to start. You can always shoot below that and above that, but it's a good place to start. And it has also to do with the, the length of your lens. Okay. And this chart was put together, um, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Roger Clark has a great site on astrophotography. But if you go, and this is comparing both untracked and tracked. Tracked meaning a motorized mount like you use on a telescope that will stick with the stars so you can shoot for much, much longer because it's tracking the stars and it matches your camera's movement to the star's movement. But here, if you look at the 300 rule, uh, the 300 the 350 rule says that it's about 10 seconds for that particular camera and about eight seconds um, for the 300 rule. Okay, so again, it depends on the camera and the lens that you're using on how long you can shoot. But this this chart I've made available to the Western New York Photo Walkers. It's up in the files area. Uh, if somebody's removed it, I'll put it up there again. But this is a great chart for you to find your lens and your type of camera, and then you can figure out where do you need to start your exposure. Okay, and this is just talking about how long your shutter is going to stay open, what your ISO setting needs to be to get a, to be another leg of that stool of the exposure triangle. That's another thing that you need to decide for your camera what works. Okay, so you want to do some exploration, find where a good composition would be, use photo pills or something like it to identify the best area where you might see the Milky Way. Uh, come up over the horizon, uh, plan your composition, 
use the, the guidelines that we talk about all the time for composition, the rule of thirds, leading lines, foreground elements in the picture, whether it's a gazebo at, at Hemlock Lake or somebody standing there. There's a variety of things you can do that gives some sort of scale to the Milky Way and some kind of context to the Milky Way picture. Uh, the best lens, usually a wide angle lens is going to give you the best. The downside with anything other than wide angle, you get above 24 millimeter and that chart, let me jump right here. If you get above 24 millimeter, your exposure is so short at between 10 and 20 seconds it's so short that it just really you end up with not enough light to really uh, get a decent image so um, a wide angle somewhere in the range of a 10 millimeter to 24 millimeter works great and then as fast as possible if you've got a 2.8 that's a great starting place probably the the best lens out there for nights night uh, both star and Milky Way and planetary photography is a wide angle. I think it was a 24 millimeter, 20 or 24 millimeter f 1.8 lens. It was the sweet spot of letting in a huge amount of light and capturing a nice wide vista, and you still have plenty of uh, uh, plenty of not only um, area that you're photographing, but it's letting in a ton of light. Okay. All right, now when we're talking about Milky Way processing, there are a bazillion ways to do it. We're going to start out with a raw photograph, and but you have to deal with multiple things instead of just cropping and adjusting your exposure a little bit. You need to maximize your exposure. You need to adjust the color. You need to adjust the contrast. You need to reduce noise and increase detail, and then you're going to go back and fine tune it. And it is an iterative process where you're going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You're going to start out with the steps I'm going to, I'm going to outline. And these are, these are ones that work for me. If you've got other ones, feel free to share because there is no right answer here. It's just this is a good formula that gets me decent pictures. So you're going to go back and forth, back and forth until you've got a look that you like and you want to balance it against, is that what I remember seeing? Now the camera is going to be able to capture more data than your eyes can see, but you will remember what it looks like and the camera you want usually you want the camera to be able to reproduce as close as possible to what you saw. Okay. So I'm going to use Lightroom. I'm going to switch uh, screens here for a second and we're going to go back and look at Lightroom and switch to let's see that one okay and Lightroom there we go okay so now this is an image Bob just let me know that's coming through okay yes it is beautiful okay so this image was at Hemlock Lake this is a raw file and this is actually there we go this is actually this one okay this is actually uh, two photographs it is this photograph and this photograph these are the true raw images and these were merged excuse me this is this and this image merged together into a panorama the nice thing with Lightroom that no other software at this point no other software does is it can take raw files and merge them into one panorama that stays a raw file so all the data is there any other programs in the market that i have seen and i'm waiting for somebody else to prove me wrong but everything else you have to save it as a tiff or as a jpeg or something a psd and most of the information is there but a raw file 100 percent of the information the image information is there so what we're going to do and the nice thing with with Lightroom is that this is the original raw file and you can see the name of it right here it was taken in 2017 okay taken in 2017 uh, with a D5300 on a, a, a Sigma 17 millimeter lens uh, it was a 15 second exposure at f2.8 at ISO 3200 so this particular photo the nice thing with Lightroom is that I can take this photograph 
and I can do multiple versions of it. I can try a variety of different things. So this is the processed one. This is what we're going to end up with. This is the original. This is the original. Um, let me make sure here. So this is number. Let's get the right one here. Uh, 3964. Let me go to my grid view here. Okay. So this is 3964. This is the virtual copy of it. I should say this is the original. This is the copy of it. So I can right click on any any photo and I can say create a virtual copy. I can have 50 versions, 50 attempts at editing this. And the beauty of it is it takes up no more space on your computer. You're using the original file and you're doing the edits inside the database, inside of Lightroom. And you're only, right now I have two of these images, but there's only one original file on my computer. So this particular file is fairly hefty um, because it's a mer two merged 24 megapixel images. So I think it was around something like 70 or 80 megabytes in size. I don't want 50 versions of that. I want one copy and then let Lightroom make a virtual copy that then I can work on, okay? So I'm going to make another virtual copy of this and we'll start this. Now I have, this is copy two and this is copy three. So I'm going to work on this with the steps we're talking about and you'll see that these steps are simply a starting place, okay? So I'm not going to show you how to do the photo merge. That's take, select the two pictures, right click, Photo merge, panorama, done. Okay, so we end up with this. Um, so, in general, there's not much there, but this is what the JPEG looks like. Very, very close to what the JPEG looks like. Um, but what we want to do is take this and apply these uh, these settings. So, if I jump over here, you'll see first we're going to we're going to try and get the white balance right. So we need to adjust the white balance, and we're going to jump over into the develop module here in Lightroom. Okay, so the way you do this, and, I, and these steps that I'm talking about here, these are not, um, these are not including every single keystroke. I always apply removing chromatic aberration and depending on the lens and depending on whether Lightroom has a profile for the lens, I'll enable these profile corrections. That's usually helpful, but in this instance, I'm not. But I'm going to come down here to the, uh, the basic panel. And the way you set white balance, at least the way I've seen everybody talk about it, and it seems to do a good job, is you maximize both vibrance and saturation. Give yourself a little bit of light here so you can see it. You're going to maximize uh, vibrance and saturation. This isn't where it's going to stay, but this allows you to get some kind of a neutral tone. So generally speaking, what you're going to do is you're going to set the tint to around, or the white balance, to around 3,800, okay? So at, wait a minute, one second here. Oh, I grabbed the JPEG. I don't want the JPEG. I just noticed as I was in the, the develop module, this is the exported JPEG of the panorama. And I'm looking at it, and there is no option to change the white balance, I, I, or very few, very little. It's not looking the way I wanted it to. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to find my. There it is. I'm going to make a virtual copy of the DNG. This is the DNG. Now I'm in here, and I'm going to reset that back. There we go. That's what we wanted. Okay. So back in here, we're going to bump up both vibrance and saturation. And Bob, you will interrupt me if somebody's got a question or if I'm going too yes, fast. To. Okay. Uh, okay, so now it, it looks ridiculous. I'm gonna come up here to the white balance and I'm gonna change the white balance and usually somewhere between 3,800 and 4,100 is a good starting place for the white balance. That turns it very green, but what I want to do is get rid of some of that green and bring just a little bit of purple in, okay? And 
again, it depends on the amount of light pollution you have. At Hemlock Lake, there's a, I, I don't I forget what village it is. It's down there. Is it Hemlock? That's at the sure. other end. Pardon? Wayland's down there. Wayland, yeah. So that generates a lot of light pollution, and we get rid of that in particular a different way. But we want to get a, a, a variety of colors up here. And then when you come back down to vibrance and satu sat saturation, saturation, and you reset them to zero. Okay, so that's step one. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to reset the vibrance. We did that. We're going to set the exposure using the histogram. And on this particular image, so on this, this particular image, the histogram is pretty good. It's a little bit to the left, but I would expect that because there's a lot, big dark area down here. So this might, this might need just a little bit of a, somewhere around one to one and a half two stops is generally needed for boosting that exposure. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to make it into daylight. It's a nighttime scene. You want it to look like night. So around add one to one and a half exposures, but you want this, the majority of this information to be somewhere around the center. What we're then going to do is we're going to drop some of the highlights. Okay. A lot of the, the light pollution you'll see here is going to be those highlights. So we're going to drop those down. Maybe we can go all the way, but I'm, I like to give myself a little bit more room if I want to adjust it further. So somewhere between 80 and 90. Um, and then the same thing with the shadows. We're going to set the shadows. Uh, we're going to drop those down to around 50. And again, if we raise the shadows, it brings up some of the, the lake. But I want to get rid of some of that... See the whitish area around the outsides? I want to get rid of some of that, so I'm going to bring this down to around 50. Anywhere around 50 will work. And dropping both the shadows and the highlights starts to get me closer in the sky to what I remember seeing. Okay. So, in these steps, and I, when I'm all done, I'll post these steps, and I'll post this part of the, the presentation as a PDF up in the the Western New York photo walker. So you can try it on your own pictures. So we're going to, uh, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to try and get more dynamic range here. And you do that uh, by, by pulling the whites and the whites are going to be those stars. So we want to pull the whites, but we don't want to clip any data. So although it's hard to see those, those points of light, those stars, we want some detail there. We don't want to blow them out. So the way you do that in Lightroom, you hold down the alt key and you press on the whites, and then you bring this up, and you'll start to see stars appear. The more you bring it up, the more stars you'll see. But any white dots that you see, that's where there's clipping. There's no data. Now, I don't mind losing data in a point of light as long as it's a single point. If I start getting more and more that cluster in the center, that's the core of the Milky Way, and I don't want to lose data there. So I want to bring this down. If you look at the histogram, you'll notice the whole histogram is sh is shifting. It's not just the whites. I'm stretching those whites out, and I want to get I want to get more and more of those stars to show up. And as a the side benefit is that it's actually raising the exposure at the same time. But I'm mainly applying it to the whites, the the high end, the the very brightest parts of the photograph. So when I let go, notice the whole exposure is brighter. We'll, like I said, it's an iterative process. We'll go back and we'll darken that up again. And we do the same thing with the blacks. I hold my finger on the Alt or on a Mac, the Option key. Click on blacks. And now if you look up here in, the, up here in this corner, notice how this is black. I can, when I click on this, if you watch this corner up here, when that first lights up, that means that there are some black areas that have no data and in the photograph it's the deepest darkest area which is right down here so I'm going to move this until I've got I don't want everything to, yeah you lost where you're, you're, uh, you're no longer in your uh, lightroom oh oh there we go ah thank you Bob there you go. okay sorry about that all right so what I'm talking about is this this uh highlight this dark alert triangle here um as soon as that lights up, that means I'm getting data that is being lost in the darks, in the blacks. So when that lights up, and I drag that black area back over to the left, 
you'll see I'm starting to lose any chance of getting any detail there wherever it shows up in that left-hand image. So I want to get it so that I'm just gotta, I'm just touching that that area where I'm starting to lose data in the very blackest part of the image, and that's where I stop using the slider. Now I come back and I adjust my exposure a little bit. You can start to see the Milky Way starting to come out of the picture now. I've got some other issues here with some light pollution, and I don't want, the skies aren't gray, they really are black, but we'll, we'll take care of that in a couple other steps here. So, at this point, I want to use either clarity or texture, whichever you're more comfortable with or whatever you like to use. Texture seems to do a better job for me, but I want to set texture somewhere between 30 and 40. I'm going to start a little on the low side. This will help to bring out uh, in this image, if I reset texture, it starts to bring out it's called micro contrast. It, it applies contrast only to the lower contrast things. Uh, it, it's a, a very fine tuning of contrast and in the finished image it, it does a great job with it. Okay, uh, Clarity does a similar thing. It's just a little bit more, it's a little less fine. It's a little bit more coarse, but it has, they have two different effects. Okay, we're going to set the vibrance Vi uh, saturation increases the color intensity on all colors. S vibrance increases the color uh, intensity of only the unsaturated colors. So it knows what's already unsaturated and it starts to raise it up. Now, I don't want anything close to that. I want to just give those colors that have very low saturation, I want to boost those up. So instead of across the board, I don't want this yellow getting yellower. I want to take those minute colors, those real pastel colors, and I want to give them a little help. That's what Vibrance does. So I give that a little bit of a boost, and again I come back and I want to drop that sky just a little bit. Okay, now we're starting to see that Milky Way come through. We're starting to see some real change here. Okay, uh, depending on your photograph, you can boost the saturation. You can drop it all the way down and you have a black and white photograph. That doesn't do us much good. Uh, saturation, I rarely go past 10 with saturation. Probably close to 5 or 6 in saturation is plenty uh, if my camera's doing its job. If I've got something where I underexposed it and there's just not, no detail there, uh, no color detail there, then I, I might use more saturation. But generally, I like things a little more muted. I find that things that I have the saturation raised on quite a bit, I end up coming back and toning it down because your eyes get a little bit jaded and you get you don't get the true picture of what you what you were going for. So I like to just play it at nice and easy with saturation. Okay, so that's. That has most to do with the exposure and with the color balance of the photograph. Now, there's two ways you can approach this because I want to treat, I want to bring out some more detail here in the lake. This lake is vastly underexposed. This is one of the first photographs I ever did of this area, uh, and I vastly underexposed this, but I do want to bring that out a little bit. I also want to do some targeted adjustments to just the sky. Um, you can do that one of two ways. You can use a graduated filter here and you can drop this down and apply two different areas. Um, the only problem with this is that it, it's a straight line and I'm not dealing with straight lines. So I'm going to use that on the bottom here when I want to raise this bottom area. So I'm going to use this graduated filter and I'm going to bring it up from the bottom because I only want to affect the lake and the hills and I want to raise the exposure and I want to raise the shadows and I want to just bring out some detail in that lake so I can see where the horizon is. In this photograph, I've fixed it in other ones, but in this photograph, there's zero detail in the hills. There's just no light there. I was exposing for the sky, and I was happy that I got that. And, oh, wait a minute. Duh, I should have tried to get some detail in the water in the lake. I can make it show up um, by 
using this kind of a filter and it's not going to affect the sky. So I'm treating them a little bit differently. This particular picture, I'm trying to fix a problem with my exposure. So I'm going to nuts around a little bit and um, try and bring back some detail in that. Um, I actually don't want, if I look, if you look real close here, there's a huge amount of noise here and it's not doing any good. There's no real, uh, there's no real detail there to see. It's water. There's nothing there. So, you know, if I drop the saturation down, it will tend to get rid of any of the color dots in this area. Um, so that'll help me. Um, so at least now I can see, and when I when I hover over this, you can see what it's affecting. I'm staying away from the hills, and I'm staying away from the sky, because I just want to bring up the fact that there's a lake there. Okay, so that's the first good shot. The other thing you can do, and this is what I, I generally recommend, um, is you can also use the dehaze filter, okay, across the entire image. So if I go back here to basic, dehaze, it has its own little magic. I'm going to bump it all the way up just so you can see. It makes things a little bit clearer. This does this particular image doesn't benefit much from it. We're going to use it in a second here in a different way, and that is um, using a large adjustment brush. We're going to actually put two adjustments here. We're going to do a large brush on the entire sky, and we're going to do another one on this yellow to try and minimize that. But that lets us paint the sky and affect only what we want with one of these adjustment brushes. So I'm going to click on the adjustment brush, and I'm going to use exposure. All of these sliders are active. This is just a starting point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a huge, gigantic brush. And I'm going to paint the entire sky. Okay, so I want to make sure that auto mask is off. I want a flow of about 30. Flow is at 100%. When I do a swash, it's a solid 100% effect. Uh, but to be able to both feather it and pick where I want it, I'm going to turn that overlay on so you can see. Um, the more I go across it, the more that effect turns solid red. Solid red means, or that deep red, means that I'm affecting that the most. And I'm going to affect it a little bit less down here, okay? If I hold the Alt key, I can go in and I can uh, remove some of that. The Alt key subtracts it, so I want a little bit less here, okay? So you, can, you want to use a nice big brush that gives you a good feathering area. I'm going to turn that overlay off. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now that's just an exposure of minus one and a half stops. I don't really want that. What I want to do is I want to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I want to do similar to what we did before, but I'm going to play around with, I want to try and get this sky nice and black without affecting the bottom. So the only thing that's going to be affected with this is the area that's in red. The area that's in light pink will be affected with it less, okay? So I want to get this so that I'm getting more and more sky detail. I want blacker blacks and I want whiter whites because the stars are, are going to be white. I'm going to drop this down so that I, I don't really care if I'm losing detail in the blacks at this point because there's nothing there. It's dark sky. So I'm also going to increase the contrast a little bit. Now I start to get that area in here, and I can keep on painting until I get the effect that I want. And now I've got the sky the right color, but look, I lost most of my Milky Way. Hark, we'll take care of that. So now what I want to do is I'm going to tr do another adjustment brush just for the yellow, Okay, so I, I click on adjustment brush, I do another one, and I'm going to I'm going to turn on the overlay so I can see where I'm painting, but I want to affect basically just down in here. Okay? 
and remove it from the hills. There's no detail there anyway, but I don't want it getting any brighter or any darker. So now I'm just affecting that yellowish area. And now I want the, the exposure to be about the same, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell the saturation, hey, suck out most of that color, most of that yellow, um, and I'm going to make it a little bit bluer. Notice if I make it much, I'm changing the color temperature. All I'm doing is taking away some of that yellow by dropping the saturation. And you can play with all kinds of things to do this. There's several different ways to do this. I don't quite like how that is. There we go. All right. So now I've minimized most of that light pollution. All right. And there's other things we can do, but that's that gets me close. Now the last one I want to do is I want to bring back out my Milky Way. So I'm going to do one last targeted adjustment. And I want to raise the exposure on the Milky Way. And so what I want to do is just a quick brush where the Milky Way is. And I can do this without the overlay on. And I can start to bring back both the color and the detail just in the Milky Way. I want the surrounding area to still to be dark, but now I can start to bring back just the area that is the Milky Way. Okay. And now I can adjust this. I don't want it looking, you know, Star Trek-y here. I want it looking as realistic as possible. So I'm going to maybe nuts around with the highlights, bring up some highlights. until I get the look that I'm I was going for and and gets closer to what I remember um, and I'm going to increase the saturation to bring out the colors in that part of the Milky Way okay now we're starting to get our Milky Way coming back into the picture okay now this is a good start. I've spent hours and hours and hours just nutsing around, getting it just the way I like it. Uh, in half an hour here, we can get pretty close. This is a version of the of the photograph, and it does get me much closer to what I was looking at than what we started out with, which is... Oops, lost it. <laughs> Hold on. Here we go. There we go, which is um, the original photograph that uh, this, okay, this looks a lot closer to what I was, what I remember seeing. Now, the beauty of Lightroom, again, I can right click on that and say make a virtual image and do another version and try different things. And this is how you'll learn what works for you. Okay, so those different steps, we're not quite done. The last thing we want to do is bring out some of that details. If I look at this and we want to come down here to the detail because there is a huge amount of noise in here that's kind of detracting from everything. So what I want to do is I want to take my sharpening, bring that up. Usually between 60 and 70 is good, again, depending on your image. We have a huge amount of noise here, so the sharpening is actually sharpening the noise. Lightroom does an amazing job with luminance and I'm going to bring the luminance to around 40, between 30 and 40. If I bring it all the way up to 100, it just ends up looking like a painting. Yeah, it gets rid of the noise, but there's no detail there. So you want to find a point where you're getting the detail you want but most of the, the objectionable digital noise is not evident. Okay, so now it's much cleaner. Um, I can raise the detail. And again, this is one of those things that, bless you, Bob. This is one of those things, this detail slider. Um, when you go from one end to the other, you can see how it affects things. And because there's a lot of processing going on, it takes a second. But that detail... Um, the detail slider brings out the detail in the stars in those bright points. And this should be somewhere between 70 and 80. Um, and then the smoothness, the color smoothness. 
Again, I like to run it all the way up to 100 just to see what the total effect is, and then back it down. Somewhere around uh, 60 to 70 is normally a good idea. Um, now, um, and on these Milky Way shots, 70 for these bottom three seems to give me a decent result. Okay, I'm going to zoom back out again. We're starting to see some nice pure colors in there without any of the distracting uh, noise in the black areas. I'm just seeing stars. All that noise is gone. Um, and you may want to, you know, drop this down a little bit. It's okay, whatever, whatever works for you. So somewhere for this, and again, this particular image was at ISO 3200. And I know for my camera at ISO 3200, somewhere between 35 and 40 is good for noise reduction. And the other thing, I don't want any sharpening of um, black areas. It'll show up as a pattern. So what I can do, I'm holding down the Alt key, and I tell Luminan or I tell uh, Lightroom to mask out. Whatever is in black, it's not going to sharpen. I only want it to sharpen the stars, the detail. So it's only going to sharpen the things that are in white, and I can pick what I want to affect. I don't want it sharpening the water. I don't want it sharpening the black sky. That'll leave uh, artifacts. I only want it sharpening those points of light that really make up the Milky Way. And I can pick how much detail I want here um, and then pick how much correction I want in luminance but now I've got the colors of the Milky Way I've got stars coming out like crazy I've got a clearly defined horizon I can see the water in the lake I'm starting I'm, I'm pretty close to where I want to be so that's one of those things that when you when you're all done you don't want to nuts with sharpening and noise reduction until you're pretty close to where you want to be with the exposure and the white balance you do sharpening and noise reduction last uh, in Lightroom, you can arrange these um, these panels in any way you want. I have them in the order that I like to use them. Uh, I like that when they brought that in. I wasn't jumping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I put these in the order that I use them. The ones that I almost never use are down here. Uh, once in a while, I'll come in here and I'll use the targeted adjustment tool, this little thing here, whatever I point at, it's going to tell me, if you look on the right hand side here, it's going to tell me whatever I'm hovered over, that's the color it's going to affect. So if I want to drop this yellow down a little bit more, I can drop the loom, the saturation of that yellow down, and I'm just clicking and dragging, but there's a lot of yellow also in the Milky Way, so I don't want to do that in this particular instance. We did that with the um, the tool up above, the the um, targeted adjustment tool, the, the brushed mask. Uh, so this actually adds a little bit of interest. It shows me there's something on the horizon. Um, I can do the same sort of a thing with the mask, but um, whether you use that or not, that's up to you, but that's a way of affecting a single color in the image. So for instance, I want to do this. This green that's down here on, on the lake, I don't know if it comes through on Zoom or not, but this green, I want to drop that green down. It doesn't really affect too much of the rest of the picture, but I want to drop that greenish, yellowish uh, tint down here, and it doesn't really affect the rest of the image. Okay? Okay. That is the most common way that I, I uh, process my Milky Way pictures. Um, and... It's several different iterations of that, and I'll come back the next day and look at it again and try it again and see if I get a better result. Still, it's a starting point, but it gives me a place where I can come in and say, okay, I like that, but I like it just a little bit brighter. Okay? And I can do different things with the adjust adjustment tool so that it, it lets me um, figure out how I want that, that image to look. So... That, in a nutshell, is post-processing. So, one of the things that we want to do is, if you're interested, and again, I'm doing this based on feedback I get from people. If I hear nothing from people, then I'll do these sessions on stuff that uh, I get questions asked 
to me from the classes that I teach. Next week, what I'd like to do, if, if you're interested, is we can talk about and do some examples of star trails and time lapse. Uh, time lapses, um, both with star trails, and I've got a great example of a Milky Way time lapse that I did, and it was, again, a first attempt at a Milky Way time lapse. Some clouds got in the way, but still came out cool. But I'll walk through the process, and I have this written up, and I've given it to several people, uh, a whole process using very inexpensive tools, uh, usually free, that allows you to compile the the images into a sequence, and then export it as a movie, and then convert it into a, a, a GIF so you can um, play it. You can post it up on Facebook, and it'll just play when anybody clicks on it. Okay, Bob, any questions? I don't see any. Well... Okay, uh, Margie just said... Uh, no, that's no problem. Okay. It All righty. It was difficult to see. Was a... Well... Uh, no, there's nothing up here. Huh? Okay, good. Uh, you could, as far as, um, oh, how big could you print this picture? Um, okay, yeah, this you can print to a 20 by 30. I've got this on my wall, and it's a good a good 20 by 30, and it looks great. Um, and mainly because it's a panorama, and it's 224. Uh, the one I printed was two 36 megapixel images stitched together. Ended up being a round uh, 60 megapixel image. There's a lot of detail there. Okay. Alrighty. Bob, quick question. When this was coming through, was it full screen on Zoom? Or was that... It was full screen on Zoom, yeah. Okay, you can choose whether it's the the gallery view or the speaker view. Hopefully people yeah, switch to. Okay. I'm the, uh, the, the co-host. I see the grid as well as I have the screen on okay. the Okay. Okay. Totally Next week... Totally black next week we'll plan on doing star trails and time lapses uh if you have any requests i'd be happy to take them but i'm gonna after this what i'm gonna look at is some of the other tools that people like to use things like registax uh, star tracker um, other tools processing tools for doing things that you can't do usually in photoshop or in lightroom or inexpensive ways to do the same sort of thing okay Great. Uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And um, that should be the end of it till next week. And look forward to uh, doing it again next week on Tutorial Thursday. Everybody take care.